Hey there, Dan Gastu here. Today's video is all about anchoring small boats. Uh, what to do and hmm, what not to do. The plan for the start of this video was to head from Dangar Island out to Broken Bay with an old mate of mine called Paul. Uh, the plan was to get some footage of what an anchor looks like when it's dragging in slightly rougher seas due to not having enough scope out, but as you'll see, things didn't quite go to plan. so much for uh, lots of swell and talking about anchoring in bad conditions. It's pretty calm again today, but we'll go through the principles anyway. On this boat we've got uh, a bit of a choice of anchors. Uh, the main one I use generally is a Danforth anchor like this. They're pretty good on small boats because they fold pretty flat, they're nice and easy to store. The other one we've got is a CQR anchor. You tend to see these more on larger boats where they sit on a bow roller. They do sit quite nicely on the front of a yacht or a trawler or something with the uh, road attached to a winch or whatever, but you do see them around. The last one's the smallest one we've got, which is a little folding anchor. It just has a, a collar that spins and you spin it, it'll fold down, and then you can put it down over the end of the flukes and spin it again if it wasn't so crusty, which will lock it. So they store really well. They're probably more something you might use in a kayak even or a smaller boat. See, they lock it well. So that's pretty much out of the question. It's not really going to hold that well in a muddy surface. So the anchor we're going to use to anchor this boat is this Danforth. This particular one's a 10 pound anchor, which by the book is a little bit small for this boat. I think they say about a pound per foot of boat. And this is probably a, almost a 17 foot boat, so much larger. But it's very calm conditions. Anchoring changes a lot when the weather gets rough. You know, we said we we're going to come out here because we thought there'd be a bit of swell. It's pretty much dead calm, so sorry about that. Once you've selected your anchor, all you really need to do is chuck it overboard. <laughs> all right, that's slightly embarrassing. <laughs> you've also got to tie it on. That's the important thing. When you go to buy a new anchor, there's a couple of ways you can go. You can buy the anchor, some rope, some chain, a couple of shackles, a thimble, that kind of stuff, and put it together yourself. Or you can just buy a pre-made kit. So I'll show you one of those now. This kit's for a Danforth anchor. It includes the anchor itself, the chain, D shackles, pretty much everything from the anchor to where you attach it on the boat, if you remember to. On the side of this kit, there's a bit of a chart showing the length of a boat, approximately, to what size of anchor, length of rope, length of chain, etc., diameter of chain. In this case, they actually do recommend a 10 pound anchor for a 5.5 meter boat, which is what we're in. And they're saying you've essentially got 30 or 50 meters of rope, a 10 millimeter chain diameter, and it comes in either a two or four meter chain length. A lot of this depends on how long you intend to anchor, to be honest with you. If you're in a boat, you're fishing, and the boat's dragging a little bit, not such an issue. If for whatever reason you do intend to anchor the boat for an extended period of time or leave it unattended, then you really are looking at making sure you're at the higher end of the scale. With regards to the chain, if you really are going to have it hold well, you really are looking at having about the length of the boat in chain. So in this case, I'd definitely go for the four metre chain. Inside this kit, pretty straightforward. Got this Danforth or sand anchor, the chain. What I will have a quick look at is just how well this shackle's done up. Something to be aware of when you get a chain out of the box. Don't automatically presume it's ready to go. It doesn't look like either of these shackles are actually done up tightly. This one's not actually done up all the way. 
and it's finger tight and this one's the same. So before I use this, I'm going to tighten these shackles and lock them off at both ends. So I'll show you two different techniques for doing that, but I highly recommend you do that. There's every chance this pin will come undone if the boat's sitting a bit of chop and, and, and vibrating. It's a good way for these to come undone. Then you'll lose your brand new anchor. The first thing I'd always do is just get some pliers, a shifter, whatever, and actually do it up tightly. Be a little bit careful because they're not the strongest metal in the world. So you don't want to use so much force that you strip the threads. But once it starts to get that little bit of tension on, it's actually the stretching in the bolt that makes it bind up and stops it vibrating loose. So make sure you've done that first. Then you've got one or two options to try and lock it off a little bit more. Once you've tightened up the pliers, you'll see a small amount of the pin actually comes through the shackle. So what we can do is put a bit of heat on this and then just peen it over, which means it won't be able to come undone easily. If you want to take this shackle off in the future, you will need to cut it off with an angle grinder or something, but I almost never take these off. And because we leave boats overnight at anchor, or at least one side anchored, um, I'd much rather have the knowledge that this is secure and not going to come undone. This is just the standard LPG torch I use for almost all heating in the workshop. A lot cheaper than uh, building up oxygen. Oxygen is quite expensive. So this aerating nozzle does a pretty good job. Once the pin of the shackle's been peened over like that, it can't fit back through the thread. So there's no way that's gonna come undone accidentally. I'll show you a different technique for the other end. But once again, starts with simply doing this up. And you can see how loose this was out of the packet. So now I'm just going to get some wire, some galvanised wire or stainless wire if you can get it, and just feed it through the hole on the end of the pin and lock it to the shackle itself. I can't find any of the galvanised fencing wire I normally use for this, but actually to be honest with you I prefer the peening method, but if I was to use wire I'd use some sort of gal fencing wire generally. This is actually just some MIG wire, but it'll do to demonstrate. All you need to do is go through the hole in the pin, Go around the arm of the shackle, then back through the pin, then round through the shackle. All you're really doing, a little bit like the split pin on a on a prop shaft, but all you're doing is locking the pin so it can't rotate. It's not going to come out if it can't spin, and then just twist it off at the end. So two ways to go. First thing to do always is tighten the, the pin up so it's got a bit of tension on it. You've got a 99% chance of it staying done up once it's got a bit of tension on it. Certainly not the way they came out of the packet. And then either tie it up with wire or heat it and peen it over. Once you've done that, anchor's good to go. <laughs> Seriously doing nothing. Right? When we went to start the boat, it wasn't turning over at all. It was definitely turning into one of those days. <laughs> <laughs> at, least that, at least that guy's gone now so we can go look for our anchor again. <laughs> oh, this is too good. All right. <laughs> you took the anchor off to figure out why the boat won't start. Okay. Divide and conquer. I'm going to get the rest of this rope in first though. Yeah, fair enough. Alright. What's up? Yeah, right, I think we just kicked the battery switch. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was tough. See, it's never that bad. Welcome so, aboard. <laughs> <laughs> so we've sorted out those minor disasters. <laughs> so, I think this anchor's still stuck. Yeah. So, if I just motor towards it, if you point. Yeah. Then. Gotcha. Which way is it heading? Okay. Lifting an anchor. That's what we should go through. Okay. Move, uh, 
anchors are designed so that they're designed to pull along horizontally on the seabed. So once you're directly above an anchor, pulling it up generally is pretty easy. If not, then it's caught on something. And try just motoring in different directions to see if you can unhook it. Should we go look for the other one we lost? <laughs> sure, I got a window in my schedule. <laughs> Paul had some quite valid nice. concerns about ending up in some sort of 2016 <laughs> fail compilation video, so we decided to head home, passing a friend who was out for a sail on the way. He could always film another day. The curse of this anchoring video uh, continues, unfortunately. I planned to do a little bit more filming this afternoon, but we had a small fire on the island, so Arnie and I got a call to go and help with that. Uh, it wasn't too bad in the end, no real property damage and nobody hurt, which is good. But it means we're going to have to uh, try again another day to finish this one off. Yes, finally made it out to finish this video. One thing I'll start with is just showing you this book. This book's called uh, The Complete... No, you're not going to see that, but The Complete Book of Anchoring and Mooring. It's actually a really good little book by Earl Hines. I just want to quickly read you the first sentence of this book, because I think it sums up anchoring quite nicely. It says, there is no aspect of boating that is less glamorous or more critical to the well-being of a boat and crew than anchoring. And I think it really sums it up. It's just not something people really think that much about. It's no more exciting than the handbrake in your car, for example. It's a little bit windy today, so I hope you don't get too much noise. I think the new mic's a bit better than the old one, that's for sure. So here's our new anchor that we've uh, peened the shackle here and we've uh, moused the shackle here. The last thing I do is when we get this rope, it can be a bit of a mess. So I'm just going to get this rope part of the anchor road, untangle it, get it ready to flow freely. New rope is particularly bad as well because it has a bit of a memory from being in the packet. I find rope, once it's been uh, in the water a little bit, it actually gets a lot easier to handle. The bitter end of this anchor road has just ends with a bit of uh, a hot knife cut. Ideally you want this permanently attached to the boat or at least with a shackle you can undo. So what I would do in this situation, I'll show you the point on this boat where you would attach that. So here at the bow, just at the front of the anchor well, there's a bit of a pad eye here designed for attaching the anchor. In a pinch you can just put it through here and do a bowline, an anchor hitch or something, but this is a really sharp edge that'll chafe a lot. So what you'd ideally do is splice an eye in that end, in the bitter end, put a thimble in to protect it, to stop it chafing, then use a shackle like this to shackle that eye to the pad eye we saw at the front of the anchor well. And that way your anchor is secure and it doesn't have this risk of chafing and breaking that way. Now quite often you won't just throw the anchor off and have the entire length. You won't want the boat to swing through such a big radius. You want to have enough rope for the anchor to hold securely, but not so much that you're swinging through a large arc. And for that reason, you'll then have it permanently attached here and then temporarily cleat off as much of the anchor as you need. So let's go through that now. I'm just going to tie this onto here for now because I actually don't have a shackle or thimble with me, but we'll go through that back in the workshop. Splicing a thimble like this into the end of a line is not much different to splicing an eye in a line. I've got a video about that already, so I won't go through in detail. But 
all we need to do is splice it on nice and tight round here, run it down, and then that's got good protection against chafing. Then we'll eventually go back to the boat, feed a shackle like that through, and then we can put the pin through the pad eye itself. So I'll just go ahead and uh, finish splicing this, and then we'll head back to the boat. Once you've got it spliced all like that, you can also do a little bit of whipping around the throat here just to make sure it doesn't uh, ever come out, but that'll hold pretty well. Once it's all rigged up, this is what you're aiming for. You've got the pin of the shackle here through the pad eye in the boat and the shackle pin done up quite tightly. Then the splice die of the rope with a thimble against the shackle here. That way you don't have the rope chafing against any of these sharp edges. So when it comes to attaching the bitter end of the anchor road to the boat, this is the setup you're shooting for. Also by law, before you drop an anchor, you need to be sure you're not within 200 metres of a submarine cable. Submarine cables we marked on local maps and charts, and it's actually law that you stay 200 metres away. And by 200 metres away, I mean, if you imagine the cable running from one shore to another, you've got to be 200 metres downstream or 200 metres upstream of the cable, just to guarantee that you don't hook it up. So that's an example of a submarine cable sign. And you can also just see that trench heading out from the sign across to the other shore. So if you anchor near a cable like that, there's a good chance you'll hook your anchor under the cable, because often they're just laying on the seabed, they're not buried. This means that you're gonna lose your anchor as well as a really good chance of damaging the cable, which is a bad thing, because that's pretty much the only way that people who work in submarines can get television, so be kind. So with my anchor rope, now it's tied onto that pad eye. I can just start laying it down backwards, as in from the end down towards the anchor, into the anchor well, and that way it should flow out pretty freely. The other big advantage to having all the rope in an anchor well like that is there's less chance of having someone standing with their foot in the bite of a rope. It's pretty dangerous if you throw an anchor and it turns out that it's wrapped around your leg or something, particularly if it's a small child or a large anchor. So that's definitely something to be aware of from a safety point of view. When you're cleating an anchor off here, try not to tie like this first up, because this puts a lot of strain on these slightly weaker parts. Always take a turn around the base first that way the most of the load is pulling from the strongest part of the of the cleat and then you can sort of do your turns like this. I was obviously being a bit silly before when I was saying you know it's nothing more than chucking it over. When you do throw an anchor what I like to do is either lower it while you're backing away from where the anchor is going to land or simply hold the chain a little bit so as you throw it the chain doesn't end up caught up in the anchor. This way you're sure that the anchor and the chain will lay flat. As I said, if it's a bigger boat, you do it while you're slowly motoring backwards. Smaller boat, you could just throw it. All right, so let's jump in and have a quick look at that. Right, so it turns out that knowing the depth of water you're in is pretty important. I'm not gonna to lie to you, these things are much more straightforward in small boats. You're generally lowering the anchor by hand so you can feel it, you know when it's hit the bottom. You know, I'm not gonna not gonna kid you that it's more difficult than it is, but knowing what depth you're in is pretty important. So what we'll do is we'll have a quick look at the sounder here and see how deep we are. So here you can see we're in about four and a half meters of water. And that's kind of really important information to know. You can obviously, in a small boat, lower the rope, sort of count it as you feed it out if it's a light anchor that you can carry by hand and get a sense of how deep you are because you you'll feel the anchor at the bottom. But a sound is a nice easy way to know straight away. How much anchor road you need to put out to hold a boat securely depends on quite a few things. The important thing I guess to take away, the simplest thing to take away from this, is the more of the rope, the anchor road you let out, the stronger the anchor will hold. And the reason for that is that in order for an anchor to hold, it has to pull as close to horizontal uh, across the seabed as possible in order to bed in. As soon as that anchor road's pulling the anchor up, it'll just lift out. That's how you get your anchor back when you're done for the day. So the things that affect this is how much chain you've got. The more chain, the less anchor road you need to let out. So if you have all rope, 
I think you need something like 20 times the depth of water you're in, so we need the 100 metres. This couple of metres of chain at the, at the start of the, between you know, the anchor rope and the anchor itself, makes a huge difference. Because that anchor is heavy, the, uh, sorry, because the chain is heavy, it's what allows it to stay on the seabed and make sure it pulls as close to horizontal as possible. I'll show you a quick picture from this book, the complete book of anchoring and mooring, and that'll illustrate it better than words. So you can see here, this is the angle we're talking about. You want the anchor to pull along the seabed, so the steeper this angle is, the, the closer the chain is to going straight up, the less that anchor is going to hold. By the time it's straight up, you can just pull the anchor back on board. So when you've got all chain, you can have that anchor road be a bit shorter, but rope and chain, it needs to be a bit longer, and by the time it's all rope, it needs to be quite long to get that angle down here. And so what this means is a ratio between the depth of water you're in and the length of the anchor road is the critical number. It's what they call the scope. Because we've got this anchor road just cleated off here, and I don't actually even have a locking turn where you tuck it under, there's very rarely a need to actually do that. All I need to do is let this out a bit, and then I can just belay this line Try not to get any knots in this line, even though it's quite new. Once it hits the bottom, in these conditions, it's actually a little bit windy, there's not any real chop. So it's pretty calm, but the wind is up, surprisingly, for, particularly for so early in the morning. So 15 metres in 4.5 metres of water is only about 3 to 1, so a very short scope, but in these conditions it's fine. If the boat started to drag, I could let out another 5-10 metres, keep going up until it holds. Now we talked about the line chafing here, that's obviously not going to happen unless you've got all your anchor line out. All the tension's now on this cleat, which is reasonably smooth and rounded, nylon, plastic, whatever it is, so no real issues there. But this anchor rope is going to chafe on this bow here. There's actually no bow roller on here. It looks like there used to be, but it's, it's long gone. So this is a really critical spot for chafing. If this boat was to sit all day on anchor in a bit of a chop, every chance you'd actually cut completely through that rope by the end of the day. In this situation, a bit of an easy fix would be just to get it over the railing somewhere quite smooth. It's nowhere near as abrasive as that sharp edge is on the bow here, but it's still just a little temporary hack fix. Really what you want ideally is a nice nylon bow roller that your anchor road comes over. So we'll do a video on installing one of those one day. We've talked a bit about knowing the depth of water that you're anchored in, but something that's really important to know as well is the composition of the seabed where you're anchoring. We talked about a few anchors at the beginning of this video, but one anchor we didn't have on board at the time I mentioned is a reef anchor, which is sort of designed for anchoring in rocky areas. So if you know the area you're at is rocky, which is quite common with fishing because, you know, you get a lot of structure, so that's where the fish are. So the idea with these anchors is they can grip into rock up to a certain load, but eventually these flukes will actually just bend. So if, if it's really hooked under a rock, you can motor away and you'll actually straighten that fluke the ankle come up and then you can just re-bend it again when you get back. I particularly like this style of reef anchor because it folds flat. It's really hard to store these in a boat otherwise. So when you want to use it, you just bring it out, bring it so the flukes are kind of at 90 degrees to each other. And when you're finished, you can put it and lay it flat. So that style I really like. And obviously this gets rigged up with the same shackles, chain, rope, etc. So on a small boat like this, I find the Danforth anchor we've been using is the best for mud and sand and these reef anchors are pretty much your only option when it comes to a rocky hard bottom like that. I'd like to go on and do a video one day on anchoring larger boats, like a cruising yacht sort of thing, because that's where it does get more critical. You're anchored overnight, you're asleep at anchor, uh, you know, everything, the, the stakes are raised considerably compared to just going out fishing for the day. A lot of GPSs will have a bit of an anchor watch, and I've got a nice little app there, I don't know if you can see that, little anchor watch app on the phone, which I quite like, where it takes your GPS location, you set a, a sort of an acceptable radius, and if your boat moves out of that radius, it sets an alarm off. So it's a nice little sort of safety net if you are going to be anchoring for a long time and you don't have anyone on anchor watch. One area where it can be critical anchoring a small boat 
is if you're going, for example, to say Sydney Harbour New Year's Eve, it's a, it's a big night, everyone comes out to watch the fireworks in the harbour, lots and lots of boats anchored. You need to be aware of the other boats around you. Putting the you know, corner of your tinny into somebody's uh, expensive and shiny motor cruiser is never a, a nice way to end the night. A few things will keep you safe from, from fending up in that situation. One is how much scope do you need to put out. You don't want your boat to drag, so you need, you know, three to one, four to one, up to seven to one, depending on the conditions. But by the same token, you don't want this huge swinging arc. Once a boat's anchored, a few things will affect which way it swings, namely the wind and the tide. If you're in a tidal area, just be aware, if, you, if you're sort of on the end of an incoming tide, it hits high tide and the tide starts to go out, your boat's gonna go from laying one way to laying the other way as soon as that tide shifts, presuming the tide's the dominant force on the boat. The other thing to be aware of is that wind and tide affect different types of boats differently. Tide predominantly affects keel boats or displacement hulls, whereas wind can be the dominant force on uh, a planing hull where not much of the boat's in the water. So if you are tying up uh, a power boat next to a sailing boat, Bear in mind, you may not actually swing in the same direction. You may end up stern to stern. Just something to be aware of. So I think that about wraps it up for today. Slightly chaotic video. Oh, what I mean slightly, very chaotic video. Sorry about that. I think it's becoming a bit of a signature, isn't it? I hope this gives you an idea of a few of the basics of anchoring. I, I really think the big threat is uh, not holding well, obviously. You do occasionally see people just tying rope to an anchor. Those couple of metres of chain between the rope and the anchor honestly make all the difference to it holding. Also make sure the anchor is big enough for your boat. I do see a lot of people with quite large boats taking out these sort of six pound anchors that have got almost no chance of holding them unless they snag on a rock. I think the next big thing really is that chafing problem. If a boat's sitting in chop, it'll cut through a rope really fast. I've got a sequence of videos coming up soon. The Green Machine, my old tinny's actually up at the workshop at the moment because it unfortunately uh, came loose in a windstorm we had not too long ago. I hadn't used it for a while because the motor had died as well, which is another story. So there's going to be a whole sequence now on getting that boat back up and running. But it was sitting tied to a wharf and both the bow and stern lines chafed through during this windstorm and that's why the boat came free. So honestly, chafing really is a big issue. So have a look at the surfaces where your anchor road might be rubbing and make sure they're as smooth as possible. Ideally over a bow roller with guides that stop it coming off the bow roller. So thanks for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please rate, comment and subscribe and I'll catch you next time. See ya.